there is no place like it, Havana. It is the most happening city in the entire Caribbean. Rich Cuban music is the soundtrack for this colorful capital. It's only 90 miles from Florida, and yet for generations so far away. But times are changing. This is now an island nation awash in enthusiasm after decades of commercial, cultural, and political differences. This is the Cuban evolution. Hello, I'm Keith Kate in Ybor City, a place rooted in Cuban history. In fact, it was the instability in Havana, including a high tariff on Cuban cigars, that put Ybor on the map. At one point, thousands of workers at a couple of hundred factories hand-rolled more than half a billion cigars a year in Ybor, making it the cigar capital of the world. But after the U.S. trade embargo on Cuba went into effect in 1961, that all changed. Today, the J.C. Newman Cigar Company is the only factory left. It is that same embargo President Barack Obama is now trying to ease through some creative diplomacy, including a trip to Havana, the first for a sitting U.S. president in 88 years. We went along on that historic visit designed in part to encourage the Cuban evolution. Not long after President Obama arrived in Cuba, the skies opened. By the time he and the first family were driven from the airport to Old Havana, it was a tropical downpour. Even so, we saw groups of Cubans braving the weather and the tight security to watch his motorcade from balconies and street corners. We just pulled along the side of the road. You can see at a restaurant, people standing under the awnings. Again, just to catch a glimpse of something that is not only unheard of here, it really will be a historic moment for them to tell their children and their children to come. You're standing in the rain. Are you excited to see the president? This man tells me Cubans are watching with high expectations. They want and need brotherhood around the world. For many, the sight of the presidential motorcade is like catching a moment in time from the future when people here can prosper and perhaps even thrive in business and freedom without what they call the blockade or U.S. trade embargo. The president campaigned on a message of hope and change. Well, now he brings that message to Cuba, and the people here are buying into it. Did you ever think you would come to see this day, the president of the United States in Cuba? This elderly man told me he never thought he would live to see this day because the political differences between the two countries were too great. Surrounded by his family, though, he stood amazed by what he was watching on the Cuban news channel. The younger generation is more expectant of the changes suggested by America. We saw a group of young men playing baseball. To them, the shared love of the game is a good way to bridge the political divide. <laughs> Justin Miles has spent the past two months studying at the University of Havana. His new classmates want to be involved in a government that allows them to succeed and prosper. I mean, they grew up in the during what's called the special period, which was the, the time of uh, the worst um, part of the economic collapse here. What is important to them is being able to uh, thrive here. When I arrived at the Jose Marti Airport, I walked through a throng of emotional people. The Reverend Miguel Salas is from Tampa. He envisioned this history-making moment during a visit in 1999 when he reached out to shake the hand of former president Fidel Castro. What were you thinking? I was thinking more than anything of what's actually happening right now, the reconciliation of both of our countries, reaching out to the leader, because when you reach out to government leaders, you reach out to the whole nation. I believe in the Cuban people. President Obama is reaching out to close a final chapter in Cold War history and seal his diplomatic legacy. But he didn't come alone on this trip. Along with the president, of course, a congressional delegation and business leaders hoping for change. We see small businesses. That's relatively new within the past five or six years. But there's more that needs to be done. What's already accomplished is a momentous achievement, the culmination of efforts that began more than a year ago to end an estrangement that began when the Cuban Revolution ousted a pro-American government in 1959. President Obama also used some baseball diplomacy on this trip with the help of the Tampa Bay Rays. Our hometown Major League team became the first to suit up for an exhibition game in Cuba since 1999. And the players, the politicians, and the fans were more than ready to play ball. 
The roar in Cuba was deafening. 55,000 baseball fans stood, screamed, and became a part of history. The President of the United States and the first family in Havana's Estadio Latino Americano, the island's main stadium, a guest of Cuban President Raul Castro. An extraordinary sight, and this invitation-only crowd is well aware of it. Do you think it's going to change anything in Cuba, the president being at a baseball game? This man told me it was good Obama was at the game and good that he's going to other places. He thinks all of it will make a difference. Viva Cuba, I love you. Uh, that one is gonna go. The Tampa Bay Rays outscored the Cuban national team 4-1, to one, but most people at this ballpark walked away winners. Who signed your ball? I don't, I don't know. This man's favorite player, Cuban-born Rays outfielder, De'Ron Verona. Uh-oh, this could be a home crowd for you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's my great, great, great. Now, what is that like, being here in Cuba? Yeah, it's awesome. Verona is among the hundreds of Cuban baseball stars who defect every year in search of a better life. He hadn't seen his family for three years before returning to this historic game where he batted first. The biggest highlight this day took place before the first pitch. The President of the United States, Barack Obama, and the first family walking into this stadium with Cuban President Raul Castro. Something unimaginable for decades. And yet, here it was. Economic and political differences set aside for the one thing these two countries can't agree on, and that is the love of baseball. Before the game, President Obama spoke to the Cuban people on government-run television, appealing for political liberties, economic reform, and human rights in Cuba. Does this offer you some hope that the two countries can work better together? Bueno, hasta ahora, eh, lo más... This man told me the important thing is a relationship has begun. We now have a starting point. Los cubanos estamos de acuerdo con... And young people are especially optimistic. This woman told me she wants better relationships between the people from our two countries, but she believes the embargo must be lifted for that to happen. The Rays players were advised not to comment on the political and cultural differences, but Rays pitcher Chris Archer feels fortunate to be part of something so historic. I think that us being here could potentially be the start of something great between our country and for the human rights of the people in Cuba. Everybody here thinks that. That's why we're excited, um, and I'm not afraid to express that. It is a feeling shared by all of the Rays players. They're welcoming us with open arms, and uh, we really appreciate to be in this position and uh, to have an impact. This is a great experience, and uh, I'm just going to not take any of this for granted. This is awesome. Time to soak it in, right? Yeah, yeah, this is once-in-a-lifetime experience, and uh, I'm seriously having the time of my life, and that's not an exaggeration. Several Rays fans took charter flights to Havana thinking they could buy a ticket to this once-in-a-lifetime experience, but despite a willingness to pay whatever the price, they were denied. This fan left with a new appreciation for what we often take for granted. Did you come just for this? This is the first time I've ever visited Cuba, and freedom is a big word in America, and I'm starting to realize how important it is. Once the game was over, the hard work began for those heading into the stadium to clean up and for the political leaders who must now put into action the hopeful vision they spent a few days and innings batting around. When we come back, more from Havana, Cuba. This is a special report. Still to come, how thousands of colorful tiles, hand-painted and assembled by a Cuban artist, inspire people to follow their dreams. Plus, the Tampa Democrat leading the fighting Congress to help President Obama lift the embargo. And a Tampa family shares memories of their years in Cuba and the day they had to leave it all behind. Good evening from Obispo Street in Old Havana. This is what you think of when you think about Cuba. The old streets, the old cars, a place where time has stood still. People have been caught in this time warp since the U.S. embargo on Cuba began in 1960. The overall feeling was let's tighten up the isolation even more to make it expedited. Elio Mueller is a Tampa lawyer who served in the Clinton administration. In the 90s, it was thought if the U.S. strengthened sanctions, it would force Cuba to embrace democracy and restore human rights, something Elio had dreamed about. When Elio was just five years old, his family fled Cuba in secrecy, leaving behind friends, family, and wealth in exchange for freedom that left them in poverty. It formed me as a, uh, as a militant anti 
uh, revolutionary <laughs> that has followed and uh, affected my entire life. When President Clinton reinforced the embargo on Cuba by signing the Helms-Burton Act in 1996, Mueller moved into the White House and became a liaison for Cuban Americans. And then I helped the administration uh, solidify the embargo. To Mueller, it made sense. The Berlin Wall had fallen. People were abandoning communism, and there was euphoria that Cuba could not stand in this new environment. We were confident, given where we were in that space and time, that we were doing the right thing. But now? Well, now I've spent a lot of effort trying to uh, undo a lot of it. Mueller continues to oppose the Cuban government, but supports the people through his church missionary work and as president of an international business consulting firm. Like the president, he's doing all he can until Congress votes to lift the embargo. But even without Congress, the embargo against Cuba is becoming somewhat of a paper tiger that the president is systematically tearing apart. For the thousands of people who've spent years rebelling against the Castro regime, watching this reconciliation process has not been easy. Elio Mueller, who lives in Tampa, is from a family that was living the good life in the city of Cardenas until his parents decided it was time to leave it all behind. When Fidel Castro forced the Cuban dictator Felicio Batista into exile in 1959, Elio Mueller was just a boy. So they came right after the, uh, after the drive for the revolution, and it was a big deal. The whole town turned out. Elio sat with his family on their front porch, cheering the revolutionary fighters. The Mueller's had a good life in Cuba. They came from successful families, and they were wealthy, young, and beautiful. Elio was named after his father, a Cuban businessman who served as a councilman. He's looking at himself. <laughs> his mother, Isabel, was a teacher. Her father owned sugar plantations. The family supported Castro until he broke his promises of democracy by embracing communism. God did not exist and that their families were not important, only the revolution. When teachers began training to indoctrinate students, Isabel wanted out. When I went home, I told my husband, now I told you I am going. Without telling anyone, the Mueller's made plans to fly to Jamaica, apply for green cards, and then immigrate to the U.S. Two weeks after the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in April of 1961, the Mueller's put their secret plan into action. And 19 days later, they were in Tampa. It was very hard. Yeah. But I did. I did for my children. I'm in all of them every day, uh, in all. There's nothing I can ever do in my life that'll surpass what they did for us. It was a major change for this once affluent Cuban family. So it went from my brother and I each having our own personal nannies uh, and living on, uh, on, on one of the most beautiful beaches in the world uh, to living in the projects in Tampa. Uh, and uh, my parents out working three jobs apiece in order to make things, uh, make things meet. President Obama's ongoing efforts to normalize diplomatic relations with Cuba is something the Mueller's are watching with great interest and new hope. He basically said, uh, we, didn't, we didn't do this change, we didn't support it, but now that it's done, let's pray to God that it works. My opinion is in 56 years, we didn't have anything, but at least now we have a little bit of hope. A little bit of hope. And that's saying a lot coming from a family that gave up so much in exchange for democracy and freedom in America. Like the Mueller's, many of the people who stayed in Cuba have mixed feelings about the president's charm offensive. Hope and excitement is muddled with confusion about what took the president so long to make this trip and what's going to happen when he leaves office. Why not before, eight years before, why not when everything has a choice to do? Why not? Now it's too late. This woman sought me out of a cheering crowd to express her frustration. There's concern about what will happen once President Obama leaves office. Will there be the kind of change in human rights and freedom the people so desperately desire and have now been teased to expect? We wanted to be a part of this historic event. 
Irma and Chaz McMullen from Bradenton are on their second trip to Cuba in three months. They want to take it all in before there's too much change. I wanted to see it the way it was. It seems to be frozen in time, and that's what I wish to see. Yeah, but a lot of people are saying it's time for change. We need to be Americanized, modernized with diplomacy and whatnot. I agree with that. I'm not sure that Cuba's quite ready for that, but I hope that they will be. Brian Longstreth of St. Petersburg feels the same. He's a first-time visitor. Here, I wanted to get here before I got too Americanized. I don't want to see Starbucks here. Uh, but I, and I was doubly excited for the Rays to be here. And then I found out President Obama would be here. The hype around the president's visit is something to behold. There's electricity in the streets. It happened time and time again during the president's whirlwind visit. Wherever he goes, people seem to gather, even when there may or may not even be a chance that he'll be seen. But just the thought of it captivates the crowd. One woman told me she knows how this particular swell of exuberance began. You're telling me thousands of people are lined up because someone made a joke? Because someone made a joke. Uh, a couple of school kids, they ran to the, um, the theater and they sh started shouting Obama, so everybody ran. It was like a mosh pit. I'm Keith Kate reporting from Havana, Cuba. How is Representative Kathy Castro of Tampa helping to make change in Cuba? You'll find out coming up. She even has an answer for those who question the timing of President Obama's trip. Plus, a walk down one of the busiest streets in Old Havana. You're watching a News Channel 8 special, The Cuban Evolution. To the foreign tourist, the Cuban Evolution may be most noticeable right here. This is Obispo Street, one of the busiest in Old Havana where the self-employed compete with state establishments and where visitors shop, eat, and meander while reflecting on days gone by. Many Cubans believe this place will fast forward into the future if the U.S. Congress votes to lift the embargo. There's as much concern about the local economy as there is over human rights issues. The concerns over human rights is something critics of this presidential visit can't overlook, calling this trip a mistake because we've seen no progress in that area, and thus a visit by the president legitimizes an oppressive regime. But the president believes what we have been doing isn't working, and maybe it's time to try something new, and this trip might just be a lasting example of diplomacy's power when dealing with old foes. Of course, mending fences can be tricky. It's a delicate process, much like the cigar rollers in Ybor City. Politicians need to have patience, skill, and finesse. Subtle qualities displayed by Tampa's own Kathy Castor as she led the president's congressional delegation in Havana. Tampa Representative Kathy Castor is an optimist. The Cuban people, their spirits are very high. The Tampa Democrat is the chief sponsor of legislation to end the U.S. travel and trade embargo on Cuba, perhaps sooner than people think. It's an audacious goal, but we're pressing for this year uh, before President Obama moves on. Castor and the president spent time together in Cuba trying to convince leaders to end the sanctions that put a cap on just about every kind of financial transaction. If you're a business, why would you invest here if you might run afoul of the law? There are other markets across the world. So the big, the next big step is for uh, the U.S. Congress to act. But that probably won't happen until Cuba deals with its human rights issues. Critics argue the president is enabling repression. Kathy Castor says those people are living in the past. But this woman is also critical of the president. Why no? Now is too late. Why now? Because the Cuba economy is changing. The economic reforms are taking hold. There are half a million people now working in the private sector or own their own small businesses. And she says the Bay Area benefits from the early reforms. Especially in travel and tourism, with the new charter flights at Tampa International Airport, they've hired hundreds of people. People in, that live in West Tampa and Ybor City can visit their families. But the Cuban government needs to bend and modernize before a Bay Area company invests. You can't build a warehouse in Cuba and hire Cuban workers if Cuba won't allow it. Until Cuba plays along, President Obama will have to use every tool at his discretion to lower the sanctions, while Representative Kathy Castro will try to do everything she can to eliminate them altogether in Congress. When we come back, making the transition from government worker to small business owner, 
see how the Cuban evolution is taking shape in the colorful town of Hymenitas. Good evening from Havana in the town of Hymenitas, where old cars roll down the streets, where tourists roam and where the walls are decorated with beautiful tile. And there's a very good reason for that. And it starts right here. The locals call this Fooster's House. It's owned by a local artist who started tiling his home beautifully with all of his artwork. And then he started tiling the entire neighborhood. The next thing you know, this place has become a tourist destination. That makes this artist a businessman, selling creations from his home studio, then reinvesting in his neighborhood. You did this wall, all of this artwork yourself? Yes, this is my prayer. Uh, my prayer is uh, for my neighbor. N my neighbor, no money. Only is my money, and my money is for my neighbor. Cuba continues to evolve ever so slowly. It's in many ways still a place that's standing still in time. But President Obama and others want to speed up the progress, and there are signs of improvement. Like the Four Corners Cafeteria, it's one of a number of growing small businesses in Cuba. Dora Esther applied for and was granted a license to open her home to customers five years ago. Dora and her husband Alberto sell homemade pizzas, sandwiches, and fruit juices. Prices range between 15 and 45 cents, and business is good. So you're creating jobs for the neighborhood. Dora told me she loves what she's doing. The average Cuban working for the government makes about $20 a month. Like most new business owners on the island nation, Dora thinks she can do better on her own. And the best part is being the boss. She opens the doors at 7 in the morning, closes when the food runs out. To an American capitalist, this humble way of life may not seem like much, but in Cuba, these are proud establishments with hope for the future. From old Havana to Ybor City, there's a feeling that years of painful and sometimes violent separation are nearing an end. Ambitious goals and strategic plans are in place, and optimism now fuels the Cuban evolution. I'm Keith Cape. Thanks for watching.